It's Brian Pillman the second, and you're listening to the Irish Whip Podcast. Welcome to the one and only Irish Whip Podcast. This week we bring the one and only flying Brian Pillman the second, not Brian Pillman Jr., folks but the Brian Pillman II. Brian is a hungry, charismatic, yet humble and eager to learn talent. We go in depth on his family, his trainers, and most of all, the pool, stone cold, ruthlessly and irresponsibly destroyed. So sit back folks and really enjoy the show. It's not PG, it's the one and only loose cannon, Brian Brian Pillman II. Shit's gonna come unhinged folks. Yeti. Put it this way, I think Sammy Callahan might as well just change his name to Invader One. I want to know why. Like, he can dodge any question. Like, I'll tell anyone that. You can tell me the f- but I, I'm going to ask specific questions. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Hold one. Arm drag. Whoa! This is Brett Screen Rep. I'm Who stripping. are you to, to, to doubt El Dandy? Because this guy's a serious professional. Rep. Screw. Rep. Hold two. On bar. Hey, get a nice shot. Brand new. Mr. and Mrs. Hunter Hurst helps her. I hate you. I hate you. I hate your hat. I hate your t-shirts. I hate your wristbands. I hate your shoes. I hate your music. I hate the C-Nation. I hate everything that you stand for. So does rule. Yeah, they do. <laughs> Hold three. Hey, Brian, what's going on, man? How's it going? Good, man, good. It's a, it's a good Thursday. <laughs> 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 so first thing, we'll just get the facts out of the way. Son of mm-hmm. WWE and WCW superstar, ECW legend, and Heart Foundation member, Loose Cannon Flying Brian Pillman, correct? You got it. That's cool. Me. So we got it all out of the way. That that's done, right? Yeah. <laughs> I am in the in the blood, in the in the in the legal department. I am Brian Pillman, Brian Zachary Pillman. My father was Brian William Pillman. So that's just a quick little fun fact for you. I'm not a legally a junior, but I call myself Brian Pillman the second. Yep. Because to me, it's you know, it's it's a great deal of symbolism to uh, carry the same name as my father. Uh, it's a great deal that I can do with my brand and, and really who I am. And as far as my merchandise and things go, you know, I think I think being the second is, is a cool route to go with that. So, and that's the thing with with and what most people don't understand is you're an independent wrestler. The way you make your mm-hmm. money is selling your merchandise, selling your T-shirts, and, and that's how you make your money to go yeah, from you gotta, you gotta place yeah. to place. Yeah, you got to hustle. It's a 24-hour day, seven-day-a-week job. You're always kind of thinking of new, different things what you can come up with to uh, get yourself over or get, get some get some sales on some merch. So, But it's fun. It's, it's, a, it's a creative process. You know, there's so many different people involved, from the rest to the announcers and, and some the guys that – help you with your promos and that. So just really enjoying it right now. I'm just kind of soaking it all in, you know. Cool. So to get the facts and to clear the air from this point forward, we are dealing with flying Brian Pillman the second. You got it. <laughs> you hit the nail on the head. <laughs> second part of this, my friend, in promoting yourself and your T-shirts, we just talked about your swag and everything that's important to you. You did, in fact, send a tweet directly to Stone Cold Steve Austin about the pool. I had uh, it had been brought to my attention that Steve did not, you know, ever pay me back for that, nor did he replace it at any point in my life. And and I thought, you know, you know, I kind of, kind of, uh, kind of resented him for that. So I had to tweet him. I had to call him out. I was like, hey, bud, I'm out here. I got to sell these T-shirts now to make up for the pool that you belligerently destroyed. Clearly drunk, coming onto my property beating up people in my yard, breaking my pool, and I never saw a dime out of it. So, you know what? I had to call him out. <laughs> That's just how that goes. And then he fired back saying that he's just doing business and, 
you know, I get that. You know, now that I'm getting in the business myself, I see that sometimes tempers flare. But you know, if I can get any help I can on on selling T-shirts, if people want to donate or anything to replace that fucking pool, and I mean, shit, that'll make my day. And here's the part that people don't realize is that <laughs> this day and age, right now, this is decades ago. So you, we're looking at a, a pool that's, if I remember right, it's a turtle pool that's green that actually had a slide. Yeah. That's like, it could have been some retro shit. Like, it could have been worth a lot of money in today's world, just looking at, at the antique market. Just the other day on the Antique Roadshow, I'm seeing pools like that going for, you know, 20, 30K, you know? Could have been a really hot item. All day long. I had that taken away from me at a very young age, and I don't know if I've quite recovered from it, but we're just taking every day one step at a time. You know how it goes? Yeah. When, it, when anybody gets their, when it, when any little kid gets their pool t- taken away, I can understand that for sure. That's, yeah. There's some PTSD issues going on there. Yeah. Third part, man, uh, just to get the facts out of the way, you in fact just did compete in an X division match with in Imperial Wrestling with Matt Seidel. Is that correct? Yeah. So uh, kind of uh, kind of an opportunity presented itself. Kind of came out of nowhere. I, I you know found out I was wrestling Matt. Was very excited. A little bit nervous, you know, this early in my career uh, when you've had as few matches as I've had, but, you know, you're still progressing at, at a solid rate. You're you're ready for the next step, but you're, you you don't know, oh, is that too big? You know what I mean? Is that too big of a jump? But, no, nah, dude, it's, it's nothing better than being in the ring with somebody like Matt Seidel, somebody who's just so fundamentally sound that they don't even have, they don't even have to think. They just breathe wrestling. They just, you know, it's just a part of who they are, so. Matt decided it was it was right ready the timing was right to put the X division title on the line and that's what he did so uh, he he did that just at the beginning of of the match I wasn't even it wasn't even uh, advertised as a title match you know there was no extra um, hype built around that it was just right there and there he felt like timing was right so he put it on the line and I gave it all I got but you know didn't come out on top but just to say that I had that opportunity early in my career is. It's very, uh, you know, it, it it makes me feel good about where things are headed as far as title shot opportunities in the future because I can I can foresee uh, many coming up soon. So it's just it's exciting to be a part of that. And we talk about Matt Seidel and 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 we'll get in a little bit of, as far as uh, your history and family history. But the biggest thing that I want to talk to you right now is your wrestling family. What does it mean to you now? As opposed to say prior to your hot yoga class when you figured out just you're an athlete, man, it's in your blood. Is is wrestling family different now, as opposed to when it was say before you took that hot yoga class and, and figured out, man, I, I think I can do this. Yeah. So like before, I, I mean, before I started getting back into athletic shape, I just I wasn't involved with uh, the wrestling world at all. You know, I wasn't really connected with any of my dad's old friends. My my mother never really kept close ties. You know, she burned a lot of bridges um, with the business and that. So I was kind of just in limbo, just doing my own thing. You know, I was going to college, graduated from college, got a really nice job, actually. But, you know, I decided it wasn't for me sitting at a desk all day. And I was like, you know what, I need to give this a shot. And that's when the that's when the, the family kind of just let me back in. You know, everybody kind of welcomed, welcomed me back into the into the business, whether they – works the original memorial shows that we had around this area or, or, you know, just, there's just a lot of Midwest guys that, uh, really were impacted by my father and like he influenced them and whether he helped train them or, or this, that or the other, uh, there's definitely just a big welcoming back party for, for me getting back into the business. And cause you got to think of the first time I got in the ring, I was four years old, you know, I was jumping off the top rope at four or five years old. So, you think a kid like me would have grown up in the business? You think, fuck, I'd already be top of my game at, at this age. That's just not how it panned out, you know. I didn't start wrestling at 14 or, or 19. I I started at 20, 24. So that's just how we got to look at it. We got to uh, we got to take it. We got to try to try to speed up the pace with my learning, but at the same time, I got to be patient, you know. I'm not gonna be the fucking uh, Hulk Hogan overnight. So you just got <laughs> you just got to. Uh, Take it slow and everything, but I'm I'm glad to be back in the community. It's definitely a, it's like you said, it's a family, it's a brotherhood. Um, I've kind of been missing out on family for the most part of my life. So to be welcomed into the wrestling world is, it's you know, it's 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 really heartwarming to to say the least. 
Cool. So you, you bring in family, and this is where I go into some cool things. Um, I'm just going to mention some five people's names here. And then uh, if you can, uh, just one word to describe them. And then after can you come up with that one word, just talk about what they've meant to you in your life and what they mean to your life now and how influential they've been in your decision to chase this dream to continue what your dad started. Of cool. course. Yeah. Uh, number one, Aunt Linda. Well, Aunt Linda, all I can say is love. Aunt Linda's been been the one that's loved me and cared for me basically my whole life. At least when I turned about 13, it was like, okay, you know, I need a, I moved out of my mom's house, moved in with my friend, and then that's when my Aunt Linda started bringing groceries over to my friend's house and, like, helping out. So, yeah, aunt, my Aunt Linda, I, I use the word aunt very loosely. She's basically my mother, right? So that's another word I could use to describe her. She's really taken care of me. Helped me get through high school, uh, you know, helped me afford my, my lacrosse equipment and, and just things that I needed to do as a kid, things that I needed to experience. I finally got to experience because when I was younger, you know, before, before the age of like 15, you know, I never really got to have that childhood. I was kind of surrounded with an environment that there was no rules. There was no discipline. It was just all, you know, it was just a chaos. And finally I got some structure in my life. So I have to thank her so much for that. Love her to death. <clears throat> Following up with that one, man. Number two, Brittany. Uh, Brittany is uh, she's always been my rival. That's for sure. Because <laughs> 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 you know we're we're that we're like three what is it, three years apart. She's a girl. I'm a boy. You can just imagine what our upbringing was like. The amount of shit we've gone through together. We're we're probably the closest siblings in our family. We're very close, you know. Uh, I've been through more with my sister than I have, with, you know, through with anybody else in this world. So she's been a part of it longest. I can't say much other than I wish she would. Uh, I wish she would give wrestling a shot. I wish she would see what she could do in this business because I think, you know, the way things are going with women's wrestling and, and everything, it, it's all, you know, it's blowing up big and there's a huge push for for women's wrestling and she's got the good look for it. Her mother was a supermodel. She's a great athlete herself. I wish she would give it a shot because I think she would have a lot of success. But, you know, it's just one of those things where we're just different people. Like I said, she's like my rival. But, like, when I say rival, I just mean kind of like opposite, you know, like you we're guys kind of just different. Yeah, she she's not as charismatic. She's She's a little more, you know, introverted. I'm a little more extroverted, you know, so... That's just the difference there. I'm 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 somebody that desires to be out in front of people and soaking up all the attention, you know what I mean? So wrestling is a common fit for me just because I'm a natural born star, I think. Uh Brittany is not so much about the the social and the people, you know what I mean? You know, you you really gotta have kind of that factor to you. But like I said, she's one of those girls, she's really athletic. I think she could make a lot of success for herself in the wrestling business given that she gives it a shot. So we'll see about that in the very future. <laughs> maybe Fly and Brian come in a second, just need the manager first. Yeah, maybe we'll break her in as a as a manager or something. <laughs> number, <laughs> I got three more here. Uh, number three, Rip Rogers. Oh, he's a, he's a sick motherfucker. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he's a sick son of a gun. No, he's – Rip is – just Rip's a good uh, role model because, you know, his philosophy is you do what makes you happy, you chase your dreams, and you don't, you know, you don't let anybody stop you. You don't give a shit about what anybody else has to say because at the end of the day, if you're busting your ass, and he'll tell you, he's like, you know, this business is not a fucking, it's not an overnight thing. He's like, people bust their ass for years before they even got their first match, you know, back in the back in the day when they, you know, They'd beat you up. They'd jump you to get you into the business just to make sure you wouldn't, you know, make sure you keep it, keep it kayfabe. And it's just like the business has changed much since he's been in it. But you can just tell he's one of the toughest son of a guns that ever walked this earth. You know, like I won't fuck with him now. I wouldn't have fucked with him then. I wouldn't have fucked with him at any point because he's just a badass motherfucker. That's all I got to say about Rip. <laughs> but he knows more about like, the intricacies and the little things about wrestling that I think probably anybody I've ever met because he is kind of like a, he's got like a savant like understanding of wrestling. You know, the way his, the way his mind works is not the same as most people's brains. If you get what I'm, 
mm-hmm. try to get at. He can see, he can see what the crowd's reaction to before they even have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just yeah. He just knows it all that much, and I don't think he's a big fan of the current product, and not everybody is. But you know, with his idea of things, is the best way to learn this craft and this art. I think it's his, like his philosophy and his psychology. Guys like him, guys like Lance Storm, guys that really understood the uh, really what it, what what it meant to be in this sport back when it was you know pre pre K Fabe. You know what I mean? Like. They they knew what it was like to get less out of, you know, or more out of less, you know. They really milked more reactions, you know. They really made things matter, so they understand a different world of wrestling than what we know today. If you're, and, you, yeah. and you bring up the old school stuff, if, you, if you're if you Hulk Hogan and you're a face and you see the Iron Sheik as a heel and you guys are in public and he enters the same restaurant, you yeah. guys are not going to acknowledge each other. You're going to try and kick each other's yeah. ass and that's what's going to happen. I, and like yeah. you said, the difference is, is that... And that just made it mean more in the ring. Like, every little thing meant more, I guess. You mentioned number four on the list, Lance Storm. Okay, so Lance is the actual polar opposite of Rip Roger. <laughs> <laughs> they are the exact opposite people in every single regard, except for how they look at wrestling. It's That's where they come together, you know? they all, They both... Lance will admit that Rip is a little bit more old school or a little bit more carny esque than Lance, than Lance himself, but but Lance straight up respects every you know, each and every opinion that Rip will have and I think that's where they kinda meet. But but Lance is a very uh very serious person, very he's got all his boxes checked, you know what I mean? Like he doesn't leave anything unsaid or unwritten, you know, I mean everybody knows what's expected of them at all times when you're at his camp, you know. But yeah, he doesn't bullshit you. He tells you the truth. Like when we trained up there, he was like, this is like the hardest thing ever to succeed in this business. He was like, 99% of you guys are not going to make it. And, and, you know, but more than, you know, more often everybody stayed in the training class and busted their ass. So it's like he broke them down the realities of it and people still stayed and fucking bumped in that ring and they gave it everything they got and we all did and we all had fucking, I thought we had some pretty great practice matches up there because Lance is just such a good, uh, he's a very good teacher. He's very good at giving you the puzzle pieces and uh, letting you put them together without, you know, letting you do too much, you know. So oftentimes, like, the students in class, were, we were actually really reacting to these matches that were put together because we were, you know, we weren't just doing it for fake. Like, oh, we'll just, you know, we'll boo here and we'll cheer here. You know, like, we were really into it because – Everybody was taking their time, and, and we all really kind of understood what he was trying to say because he would say it a lot, and he would repeat himself. And just an overall, I think he's a natural, natural trainer. I think he's responsible for training uh, many of the women in our industry. So he's very responsible for the for the influence right now with the women's wrestling and the, and the surge and uh, better female workers uh, across the board. You know, so. Just an overall renowned trainer. Wouldn't have wanted to learn from anybody else. But, you know, as far as personality, he's like the opposite of Rip Rogers, where he's just last last person on here, my friend. One word to describe. The fly and Brian Pillman the second. Um, I would say I'm a hungry person. That's the word to describe me. I'm always looking for the next big thing. I'm always looking to improve or what can I do? You know, what opportunity can I jump at? To be honest, as hungry as I am, I didn't expect to be uh, to be able to consume as much as I'm able to consume in this short amount of time of my wrestling career. So, you know, I kind of jumped the gun a little bit. You know, I kind of booked up a lot of dates really quickly because I wanted to just consume that knowledge and just really just drill it in, drill it in, drill it in, grind it out. You know, I wanted to go out there and have matches where, you know, we're just going out there and doing it. You know what I mean? Like, you don't even see the guy until you get in the ring with him. Like, the locker rooms are separate. You know, old school, cape. you know what I mean? Like, I've done shows like that. I've done shows, all kinds of different styles. So, just this quick, short amount of time, I'm doing, like, okay, this guy works like this. This guy works like this. I've got to be able to do both, you know? So, I'm really fortunate, too, that I get to work with a lot of vets because, that hunger is satisfied by the veterans who can tell me where I fucked up and 
and let me know like how to improve and how to increase my my chances of success in this business. So if I had to describe me, I'd say I'm very hungry. I'd say I'm I'd say I'm an aggressive uh, wrestler in the ring, and I try to you know because you can tell you can tell I'm coming I'm coming to eat you know I'm hungry I'm coming to eat every single match I'm coming to eat and uh, that's just how I that's how I look at it. I look at everything as an opportunity to improve and to advance in this business. So you've talked a lot about about styles and, and people, um, especially the match that you just had w- with Matt Seidel, and, and you touched on it, man. Is it's you never know when the opportunity is going to come, what that opportunity is going to be, and you never really know how long you're going to be in this business because Matt Seidel has been doing this for a long time. Especially when I can say that I had the, you know, we we interviewed this kid a long time ago, and it comes full circle with you. The biggest thing that I can see and what I hear and just what I've read is that you pick up things very, very quickly. You learn very, very quickly. You're a natural athlete. What's the difference between training and then being in, in a ring or a match or whatever anybody wants to call it, a work of art, a performance, whatever, with somebody like Matt Seidel? Oh, it's just it's completely different. I mean, I wrestled a lot of guys. And, and, and granted, I wrestled Lance in, in training. Back when I was training with Lance, he would actually do matches. He gave everybody one match with him. But it is way different when you're out in front of a crowd and, and you get to experience what, a, you know, what somebody who's out there in today's business, how they work. And it's really enlightening to just see, like, okay, like, you know, they wait for these reactions or this is what they do. Uh, when this happens and then how they cover, you know, if, if this spacing is not right, they'll cover it up with this move. And, and it's just really cool because what people don't realize is veterans, 10 years, 20, 15, it don't matter how long you've been in this business. These guys make mistakes all the time. But you guys don't know that because they cover that shit up and, you know, we move on with our match and we fucking have a killer performance. And, and it's kind of, uh, it kind of, you know, lights your adrenaline up with maybe, you know, maybe you just throw – too stiff a strike or something and you really check the guy and it's like you just kind of fire each other up a little bit maybe you get him back with one you know what i mean it's not like the olden days where they just beat the shit out of you if you if, if you fucked up in the match you know so he could cover up my stuff and really take care of me and man i just sold you know like i could everything i could for him because he just he knows everything you know when someone like him i mean i think he started wrestling when he was like 15 or something you know 20 years in the business guy's 34 years old and they just, like I said, they just breathe, they breathe wrestling. And, and when they're breathing it and you're inhaling it and then you're, you know, you're breathing it back out. So we're out there and we're just making magic. And that's one of the few nights I was like, okay, like, I really feel like, I really feel like I'm a fucking, you know, I'm a pro at this. Like, this is really cool. So obviously I'm not anywhere near his level, but, I, you know, not even scratching the surface of, uh, of his level, but just seeing that disparity, seeing like, oh, I could be there one day just by witnessing him doing it in the ring was, was really cool, really enlightening for me to see that. What was the, what's the confidence level before that match to after that match for you personally? Uh, well, <laughs> when Jim Ross critiques your match and uh, gives you some positive and feedback, but also some, some serious critiques, you definitely feel good walking out of there with some knowledge. So I didn't feel like, oh, I had the match of the night. You know, we had we had the crowd there, and, and you know, we had a high moments, but... uh. I think what benefited me the most was the critiques that I received from from Nick Dinsmore, Eugene, and uh, as well as Jim Ross, and obviously Matt as well, who told me about during the match what I needed to work on. And but also it feels good to get the positives from them too, you know. So they let me know what I'm doing good, what looks good, what I'm doing right, and what I'm doing wrong. And I think I I think I leveled up when I left there. So definitely definitely went up on the experience uh, totem pole. And, and speaking on experience and styles, I mean, you're, you're doing some stuff with OVE, correct? Some lucha style stuff. Yeah, we're uh, we're we're diving more into that as we as we develop our class as a whole. You know, we're doing a lot of promos, a lot of different activities in our training. Um, you know, I've learned a couple a couple lucha esque things there, and a lot of it's coming down to uh, People's got different. There's a bigger class now. And everybody's got different styles, and we're trying to incorporate kind of everyone's. They got like two and three coaches now, so um, we're learning a lot more than just that. So yeah, that's it's basically becoming a uh, a pretty big uh, kind of academy type deal where it's like different coach. You go with this coach if you're this style of wrestler. You know what I mean? You go with Dave if you're this. You know what I'm saying? So. 
we're really starting to break things down and uh and bounce ideas off of each other in that regard. So if anybody wants to promote you specifically, how do they get a re- how do they reach out to you? How do they touch you? How do they interact with you? How do they make sure you get to shows and do stuff like that? How how does a fan that's listening to the show, how do they help support you the most they possibly can? Yeah, so uh as far as you know, getting me getting me a show near you, you know, let your local promoters know that that's who you want to see, and they can contact me through through Twitter. I always do through Twitter. Um, Facebook has been a big thing for me, but not you know not everybody can add me on there because I uh, ran out of limits on my friends' requests. But <laughs> but Twitter, <laughs> Twitter and it's, Twitter and Instagram are usually uh, should be open. So you send me a message, and I'll I'll approve your uh, a request, and I, I just like to use that because to me it's quicker than email. You can send pictures instantly over Twitter and that, so it's uh, it's just a lot quicker than email. A lot of people like to use email, but you know I don't like waiting on an email all the time. So use Twitter. Use you can catch me on Flying Brian Jr. and uh, it's been a pleasure, brother. Uh, and also on Instagram at Flying Brian Forty One. Now the Forty One was my father's uh, football number when he played college at the Miami Red Miami of Ohio Redhawks. It was also my football and lacrosse number when I played sports. So he, uh, that's where that 41 comes from. Yeah. Your, your pop played, uh, played football at the same college at the famous Ben Roethlisberger, Miami of Ohio. So yeah. if people don't yeah. know that if people don't know who Miami of Ohio was, you can relate yeah. Brian Pillman the first to Miami of Ohio. And he was, yeah. He, he was roommates with the head coach of the Ravens, John Harbaugh. Right. Well, yeah. man, I, yeah. I really, I really want to tell you, I just, I just want to thank you for the opportunity. If there's anything that we can continue to do for you, um, that's what we're here for. Make sure you check out Flying Brian on Instagram. Make sure you, d- you shout out to him on Twitter. I appreciate you. You bet. Always. Again, we want to take the time to thank the one and only Flying Brian Cohen II for taking time out of his busy schedule. Much appreciated. Next week, we have, again, Rex Andrews returning from Japan. Wrestle One, Reality of Wrestling Mogul. I guess you could say. He's going to be joining us next week. So, in the famous words of Joe, as he's over in London, kicking it with the boys for the Walker Stalker Con, see you next Tuesday.